morning. We welcome you to our services this morning. Begin with number 29. 29. We'll sing all three verses. Christ for the world we sing, and then we'll be led in our scripture reading and prayer before dismissal to class. Let's sing out together. Christ for the world we sing. The world to Christ we bring with loving zeal. The poor and them that mourn, the faint and all the born, sin, sick and sorrow, on whom Christ doth heal. Christ for the world do we sing, the world to Christ we bring, with fervent prayer, the wayward and the lost, by restless passions tossed, redeemed at countless loss, from dark despair, Christ for the world we sing, the world to Christ we bring, with one accord, with us the work to share, with us reproach to dare. With us the cross to bear for Christ our Lord. Good morning. The scripture this morning will be located in James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. Who is a wise man and a dude with knowledge among you? Let him show out of good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and strive in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envy and strive is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is, is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of the righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this day. We thank thee for the good night's rest. We thank thee for the opportunity we have here this morning to come here and worship thee and study thy word. We ask you to be with those teachers that have, that are planning their lessons, that we as students will listen attentively to the words and apply that knowledge to our lives. Continue to be with us through this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are so thankful for your presence this morning. We do have visitors among us, and we're especially grateful for that. We invite you to be here any time that you can with us here at Bremen. We'll dismiss now with the nursery, preschool, kindergarten, and elementary school classes. Middle school, high school, and adult classes dismissed. 
think I told you wrong last week. I think I said last week that we would be looking at the Apocrypha this week. I don't know if I, I can't remember if I said that or New Testament canon. Um, this week we'll look at the New Testament canon and then the Apocrypha. They, the Apocrypha are of, of such a nature that they kind of just make almost really a study of their own because uh, that's one of those that a lot of people have questions about. Um, so we'll look at that in a separate lesson. Uh, it, it, it may be next week. I don't know. It depends on how far we get uh, in this lesson. But what I want to do this today and, and part of next week, if that's what it takes, is look at the New Testament canon the same way we looked at the Old Testament canon <clears throat> and look, look at that. The Apocrypha really, and I guess that's kind of why a lot of people put it in a separate study of their own. Lightfoot in his book has a separate chapter just for the Apocrypha uh, because it really doesn't belong to a study of Old Testament canon. It really doesn't belong necessarily to a study of New Testament canon because most of the events of the Apocrypha are in between the Testaments. Uh, not everything, but a lot of it is. And a lot of it was written in between the Testaments, so it's kind of hard to pin it down to either one of those studies. So I guess that's why many times people put it <clears throat> in a separate lesson. But, but that's what we'll do after this. But I want to look at New Testament canon starting today. Uh, this is the question that a lot of people uh, have and, and, and where a lot of people get hung up as far as the Bible. Most people, I think, understand that for years and years and years and years, the Old Testament canon was set, it was recognized, it was understood. <clears throat> the only question anybody ever has is what we talked about the um, latter part of last week's class, the, or no, the first part of last week's class, the councils at Jamnia, uh, and those really weren't to discuss Old Testament canon. Now, it came up in those councils, but that wasn't the purpose of, of those councils. And, and even when it came up, they confirmed the 39 books of the Old Testament that we have. Now, they numbered them a little bit differently, joined some books together and they actually listed 22 but it was the same text that we have today but with the new testament a lot of people a lot of people think that there was very little uh, demarcation between inspired writings and uninspired writings or <clears throat> or not what's, what's the word i'm looking for uh, authoritative versus non-authoritative <clears throat> apostolic versus otherwise they a lot of people view that there was this muddy idea of what was scripture what was not scripture until there was this council held and they decided okay here are these 27 books these are the authoritative new testament of jesus christ everything else is excluded but i'm here to tell you it's it, that history doesn't bear that out history does not support that idea uh, the the new testament church in the first century and really even the first first several centuries beyond that they were not nearly as naive as we sometimes like to think that they were or at least sometimes people portray them as being uh, and, and i've told you before about some of these folks some some of them i know uh some of them friends of mine that have now gone into uh i, I guess you would call it agnosticism and they ask some of these silly questions like you know well which which works are inspired how do you even know what books belong in your new testament because you know, there were hundreds of writings in the New Testament times. Well, sure there were, but that doesn't mean that they were all taken to be Scripture. Uh, the New Testament church was, was not that naive, and you'll see that as we go through this. <clears throat> this was the hardest one for me as far as organizing. I had, I had a little bit more from my notes, uh, from preaching school, from other, other sources, and trying to get it all to fit together sometimes was not the easiest thing to do, so... Uh, bear with me if some of this, you, you, if, if maybe toward the end you think, well, that would have been better at the beginning. It might have been. <laughs> so sometimes when you're using a lot of this study, I've used, I've relied pretty much solely on Lightfoot's material, uh, and it's just that good. But on this part of the New Testament canon, I found some other material from class notes, from other sources, and I, I tried to incorporate some of that in because I thought it was helpful. Uh, let, let's ask the question, first of all, why study canon? This would apply Old Testament or New Testament, by the way. To understand, number one, that we're not going to be receiving any new revelation. This is very important. The canon is closed. And so when someone stands up today, and, and, it, and it happens sometimes, somebody stands up in, in an assembly such as ours, and, and they may say, I have a revelation from God. Well, I know automatically 
No, you don't. Because I've studied, and, and hopefully you're understanding that as we go through this study, that the canon is closed. We're not going to be receiving a new revelation. God says, I've given you all things that pertain to life and godliness, 2 Peter 1, 3. Well, what does all leave out? It's, it's just that. It's all. So that's one reason we need to study canon because, you know, that's, that's popular today in, in some religious circles for somebody to be receiving a revelation. And it's amazing because on any given Sunday... You can have, in one service, somebody stands up and receives a revelation and says, God told me, and then tell what God told them. But then at the exact same time, somewhere, and sometimes even in the same town, there may be somebody standing up in another assembly saying, I have a revelation from God, and say something that directly contradicts what the first person said. Now you tell me who's right. Is the Holy Spirit that uh, out of his mind that he's telling two people two completely contradictory messages? It's not... It, you know, God is not the author of confusion, folks. And so one reason we study canon is we understand that we're not going to be receiving any new revelation. God has given us his word, and he says, uh, I've put it in writing. Uh, Brother Brinkley has a sermon, you know, called You Better Put It in Writing, that when God has something important, and we understand that as people, when there's something important, you're going to buy a house, you're going to buy a car, you don't go down to the automobile place and, you know, whether it's financing or whether you've got the money in hand and you, you, you pay for it and say, well, you know, uh, so, so I own this car, I've got your word on that. Well, you know, you don't do that. You say, I want it in writing. And you go to close on that house. I remember the first house <clears throat> Reagan and I bought, I thought I was going to have writer's cramp from all the signing you have to do. You know, but, but they want it in writing. Every little detail's got to be in writing. We understand that as people. And when God deals with something as important as the salvation of men's souls, he puts it in writing. It's not going to be just somebody standing up saying, well, I've got a revelation from God. It's in writing. And so God says there, there was a time when he put this treasure in earthen vessels. The apostles were walking Bibles, but God has put it in writing. And so that's one reason we study this subject of canon. And by the way, um, just to, as a reminder, what is canon? I think most of us understand that by now from this study, but just, just in, by way of reminder. Just a, not, I'm not looking necessarily for a textbook definition, just in your own words. What is canon? Yeah, it's, it's the authorized books of, of God, of Scripture, at least in this context now. Um, you know, there, canon can be a very generic term. You could talk about, um, y'all know I love J.R.R. Tolkien. I love all things Tolkien. Uh, Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, The Silmarillion, all that. They, you know, sometimes people talk about the canon of Tolkien's work. There have been other things that have been done, sometimes by his son, sometimes by other family members or, or other folks looking to add to or compile some of his stuff. And so sometimes people will talk about the canon of Tolkien's work, or what, what actually belongs in there and what's some third party just coming along with, with, without any kind of real authority and adding that in. But when it comes to Scripture, we're talking about basically what books belong in the Bible. I mean, that's that's about the simplest definition I could think to give it. And so when we talk about canon of the New Testament, we're talking about what books belong in the New Testament. What books are inspired scripture that God intended for us to have for all time to take the gospel into all the world and fulfill the Great Commission. Number two, we study canon <clears throat> to understand that no book that is in our Bible, Old or New Testament, got there without being thoroughly vetted, thoroughly investigated, thoroughly examined to determine, does it belong? It wasn't a haphazard, you know, I like this book called, uh, this, this book called The Gospel Account of John. I really like that. It was a good read. And so uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vote for that to be included in our Bibles. It didn't work that way. These books were thoroughly examined. Does it belong? There were books that sometimes, and you'll see that as we go through the New Testament canon study, there were books that some people liked that maybe a certain region of the world they really liked him, and maybe it's, a, maybe it's a fellow who was an elder in a church somewhere, and he had a, 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 a big uh, influence over the churches in that region. And so maybe he wrote a letter, and people try to uphold that almost as Scripture. Even in those cases, number one, realize that those were the exception, not the rule. Even in those cases, even though people would hold it in high regard, that, that letter or epistle, very rarely did they mistake it for Scripture. 
Uh, number three, to become aware of attacks on the Bible and to be equipped to deal with them. That's why we study canon. There are attacks, and, and, and I've mentioned several of these throughout this study, especially the last few weeks, from people that I've, I've been acquainted with. As I mentioned, one guy was, at least at one time, was a good friend of mine and now has become uh, so agnostic and anti, um, anti-Christian that I've, I've even gotten to the point where I just uh, I, I unfriended him, as they say, on Facebook because I got tired of reading some of the silly things he'd put on his Facebook, sometimes just ungodly things. So <clears throat> there, are, there are people out there that will make these attacks on the Bible. They're foolish. Uh, many times they are, there are things that they know better, and, and you know, I've, I've mentioned this before, so many times it gets down to people just wanting to do what they want to do. But there are people that have genuine questions, and so one, that's one reason we studied this. Yes, sir. Well, yeah, if it was apostolic, it was almost without question accepted. Right. And, and there were some that, uh, that did not. For example, um, Luke... There's, there's no evidence that Luke had face-to-face contact with, uh, with Christ. And so, you know, that's, that's not a, the determining factor, but you're right, that is one of them. Uh, and, and we'll see that when we look at some of the criteria for a, a book being canonized in the New Testament. And that's one of I mean, if it was apostolic uh, and, an, and an apostle wrote this and said this is uh, an authoritative word from God, for example, 1 Corinthians 14, 37. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Well, that's coming from an apostle of Jesus Christ. Uh, you automatically know Paul is putting a stamp of canonicity on the book or the letter of 1 Corinthians. So, but yeah, in, in fact, we'll get to that in just a moment. That's, I don't, that's not here, I don't think. No, not yet. Um, let me get three volunteers. Uh, well, two volunteers. We won't read all of Acts 5, 1 through 11. Let's, who wants to get Matthew 19, 28? Brother Chris? And then uh, who else had their hand up? Gary, Scott, one of y'all. Uh, John 17, 20, and 21. Here we're kind of looking at a concept of canon. To understand this, and, and of course, I, don't, well, I won't get ahead of myself. I, you'll understand this more at the end of this slide. Uh, Chris, you got John 19, or uh, Matthew 19, 28. All right. I, sometimes people misapply this passage and try to make it apply to all Christians. Jesus is specifically speaking there to the apostles. He says when he sits on his throne, that's at his resurrection, he ascends back to heaven, he sits on the right hand of the throne of God. He says, you, the apostles who have followed me, you'll sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So, of course, the Israel of God now is the church, it's the spiritual Israel, not, not physical. So he says they're going to be in a position of authority. So that's, that's the concept right there. The, this authoritative guide in that, in that immediate sense after the church was established is in the apostles. Uh, John 17, 20, and 21. Who's got that? Go ahead. Okay, <clears throat> we often emphasize it, and rightfully so, from this passage, that Jesus is praying for unity among believers. But notice what he says in there. He says, I'm not praying for these, the apostles alone, but for all them also which shall believe on me through their, the apostles' word. So he's praying for all of us down to this very day and, and for future generations who will believe on Jesus through the word of the apostles. Well, that authoritative word that they're teaching is, 
leads men to faith in Jesus Christ. So again, there's that concept of canon. Now, Acts 5, 1 through 11, what is that the account of? We won't go and read every single verse there, but... Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, what happened with Ananias and Sapphira, in a nutshell? Uh, I used to tell the pew packers classes when we would talk about this, the, the easy way to remember it is they lied and they died. <laughs> and uh, so they, they lied about how much money they gave to the church. Now, understand their problem was not that they didn't give all the money to the church. Peter says, while it was in your own hand, it was yours to do with what you will. You know, God expects us to give, but he's not saying they had to give. They had this sale of land, and he's not saying they had to donate 100% of that profit to the church. Barnabas had done that. Barnabas received some kind of recognition from the church, and it seems that probably what they were wanting was the same kind of recognition, but, but keeping some of that money for themselves. But be that as it may, whatever reason there was, they donated some of the money to the church, but they lied and said, oh, we're giving 100% of the profits of this sale to the church. Peter calls them in. Did you do this? Did you really do this? They continue to lie about it. Ananias, of course, first drops dead. Then he calls in the wife. It, tell me, did you, did you sell the land for someone? Oh, yeah, we sold it for that. We donated 100%. And, he, of course, he says the feet of them that carried your husband out are at the door, and they're going to carry you out. So then she drops dead. Well, here's the question. How many of us would be here if God just struck people dead for lying? I mean, we'd have a pretty small assembly right now. I dare say there wouldn't be anybody in here. If, if, if you ever told a lie and you were struck dead by the Lord, okay? Even for telling a lie to someone who's a member of the church, maybe even in a position of authority, what, what then, what, what's special about that situation? Why did God decide to deal with that in such a firm manner? It's, it's an example. It, who, of course, number one, Peter says you haven't lied to men, you've lied to, to God. And of course, he also says in the same context, they lied to the Holy Spirit. And I learned from that that the Holy Spirit is God. That's, that's another study, but uh, here's the thing, though. What is God's authority at this time? Or but let me rephrase that. Who is God's authority at this time? The apostles. They are the authority. Can you imagine what that first century church, that early church would have been like had word gotten around that Ananias and Sapphira had done this and just got away with it? You, you imagine how that would hinder the respect for the authority of Christ's apostles. But as it was, uh, is anybody in Acts chapter 5 right now? Anybody, anybody there? Somebody, somebody, go ahead. Brother Ricky, read verse 11 for me, please. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all those who heard these things. Not... Oh, we're just terrified of God. This is the reverential, respectful fear. This is the kind of fear that, that a parent expects out of his children. I don't want my children just to quake and shake every time they see me, but I want them to understand if you get out of line, then dad is going to have to deal with that, and he, and he will. But this is a reverential fear, and because God dealt with that, it preserved that respect for the apostles' authority, and now people know God means business. When he, put, when he says, these are my apostles, these are my ambassadors, he means it. And so at that point, you have an apostle who a little bit later in time writes, if you think yourself to be a prophet or spiritual, acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. You think that carries a little bit more weight now, having seen what God does when you challenge the authority of an apostle? Certainly it does. So there, again, is that concept of canon that's existent even before these first writings, before any writings have come about. The first Christians had access to uh, the Old Testament. They had access to the apostles. Uh, Brother Gary, you were going to read from a while ago. Will you get 1 John 4, verse 6? And then somebody else, uh, who wants to get Acts 2.42? Okay, Brother Ricky. Go ahead. 
All right, he says, we are of God. And here's an apostle saying, we are of God, and he who hears us hears God. Well, that's, that's a claim to some serious authority. But that's what Jesus said to them. Whatsoever you've bound in heaven, or you've bound on earth, or you bind on earth, shall, and of course the literal translation of the Greek there is, shall have already been bound in heaven. So they're not making new authority, they're just binding heaven's authority here on this earth. And whatsoever you loose on earth shall have already been loosed in heaven. So, you know, Jesus vested in them a certain amount of authority. Uh, Acts 2.42. So they're continuing in the apostles' doctrine, which, of course, I think it goes without saying, is not their doctrine. It's the doctrine of Christ that they're preaching. Um, even on the birthday of the church, there was a canon because you have inspired apostles standing up, preaching an inspired message, inspired by the Holy Spirit, from the Old Testament and making application. Here's the fulfillment of this prophecy in Joel. And, of course, he concludes that sermon by saying, Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Know that this Old Testament passage in Joel, this is it right here today. This is the fulfillment of it, and this is the Christ here, Jesus, whom ye have crucified, and you need to submit your life to him. But that's, that's canon because you've got the apostles standing up and preaching by inspiration. Uh, metaphorical use of canon. 2 Corinthians 10, 13. Who wants it? Okay, Brother Chris. And Galatians 6, 15 and 16. Scott, thank you, sir. This, this is interesting because you see a, it, it's, it's a metaphor, but it gets the idea here of, of what canon is. Go ahead if you got that, 2 Corinthians. <clears throat> He says, we're not going to boast beyond measure, but within the sphere of the limits that God has set for us. Limits are, they're just that. We understand what they are in our language today. You get out on the interstate out here, there's a limit. They say the speed limit is 70. You go above that, well, you, you're running the risk of getting in trouble there. And of course, you, if the policeman's doing his job and we're above the speed limit, he's going to stop us. The difference is with God, you know, a policeman can't be everywhere at all times, but when God sets a limit, it's, it's hard and fast. A policeman may decide, I'm going to be slack or whatever. But, uh, but there's another limit on the interstate. If you ever notice that, it says there's a minimum speed limit. I think it's 40, is that right? Uh, so you can't get out there on just any old vehicle and be putting along at 25 miles per hour. Um, sometimes <laughs> I have a grandfather who's uh, 93 years of age, and he finally stopped driving, thankfully. But uh, we had a family get-together one time, and I thought, I am going to get uh, run over. Because he got on the interstate, and he just had to go a little ways on the interstate to get to his house. But uh, I was behind him, and I thought several times I was going to get rear-ended because we were driving along the interstate at about 35 miles per hour. But there is a, a limit, lower limit, and an upper limit. And so we, we understand what limits are. But that's, that's the idea of metaphorical use of canon. Paul says we're not going to boast outside of these limits. We're going to stay within that sphere that God has set. Well, that's what a canon is. It's a, it's a limit for these books of the New Testament. And, and really that applies to the Old Testament as well. Uh, Scott's got Galatians six fifteen and 16, please. All right, circumcision doesn't avail anything, neither does uncircumcision avail anything, but um, remind me again, Scott, I just went blank. Faith which worketh by love, is that it? New creation, okay, sorry. Um, it's not circumcision, it's not uncircumcision, it's, it's being a new creature in Christ. But he says, as many as walk according to this rule. And again, that, there's that metaphorical use that... that illustrates it so well for us because we understand what a ruler is you know if something is supposed to be a certain length especially if you're building something you understand it's very important you stay within the rule and that you use the right measurements when you're building something so that's a metaphorical use limits within this sphere of limits or, or a rule 
<clears throat> Brother Moser says this in his book, the church was and is to walk or exist according to a divine rule. That's canon. There is a pattern beyond which no one can go and still please God. That's, that's a good statement here as we're looking at the concept of canon. And so I told you this, all this would make sense at the end of the slide, and, and here's what we're getting at. The church, therefore, has never been without a canon. And people need to understand that because sometimes people say, you know, I've told you I get frustrated with the statement that some certain group or some certain folks gave us the Bible. No, God gave us the Bible. God gave us his authority, his divine pattern. The church has never been without that. Now, it may not always have been in written form. It may not have always been bound in a genuine leather cover or a bonded leather cover or whatever you've got, but the church has never been without, completely without a canon, a rule or a limit, a, a sphere within which it operates. Let's look at some stimuli for the providential collection of the canon. There are some things that brought about the need to draw it all into one, even though the church was never without a canon. So well, what, why did they start bringing it together? Was it a church council or was it something else? Well, you'll see it was something else. God's providence is at work here, but there were some factors, uh, that, uh, some things that stimulated that collection. There was the need for authority. John 16, 13 uh, I've already mentioned 2 Peter 1, 3, where he says, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Uh, somebody get for me John 16, 13, please. <clears throat> I always confuse this one with John 14, 26, so I'm not even going to attempt it. Okay, go ahead. Does this guide you into all truth? Okay, go ahead. Okay, when the Spirit comes, he will guide you into how much truth? All truth. It's interesting there, by the way, that Jesus even says the Holy Spirit is not speaking out of his own authority. He's speaking by authority of the Father. That's not to say that he's less than the Father. The Holy Spirit's God. We saw that in Acts chapter 5. But it's just that's God's plan. It's kind of like when, uh, when sometimes you preach God's role for women in the church and somebody says, oh, you're, you're degrading to women. And sometimes people even say, well, Paul didn't like women. He was degrading to them. No, God has always lifted up the woman and glorified the woman. And any man worth his salt will understand how wonderful women are. I'm telling you, I, I've been, when I was in preacher school, I've worked with congregations out in, in the sticks in Arkansas and sometimes down in Mississippi, little congregations that would have preacher students come and preach. I've, I've been in congregations that literally would not be in existence if it were not for faithful Christian women because some of the men were too sorry to do what they ought to have done and step up to the plate and be a man and, and, a, and the head of their home. So, you know, God, God's always glorified women, but God has a role for men. God has a role for women, and God says, that you know, perform within that sphere, within that canon. And so... Even with the Holy Spirit, that's God, that was God's plan. The Father delegates this authority, and he gives the message to Jesus. Jesus comes to the earth, and he says, and see, sometimes people get confused about Jesus and think like he's a little God. You know, you, you've got big God, the Father, and then you've got little God, Jesus, and sometimes even people think the Holy Spirit's down here a notch below Jesus. They're all on an equal plane. They just have different roles. And so God delegates this message jesus comes and he does the will of the father and then the the spirit gets the message from the father and he's he's jesus says he's not going to speak out of his own authority he's going to speak by authority of the father whatsoever he shall hear that shall he speak but anyway there's this need for authority in the early church well what do we do okay we've obeyed the gospel of jesus christ we're children of god we're fellow heirs with christ so so what now what's next you need that authority uh, the new testament canon was on par with the prophetic inspired nature of the old testament second peter 3 2 who, who wants to get that 
not spoken before by the holy prophets and by the apostles. So the New Testament canon is right there on a par with the uh, message of the Old Testament. In fact, we'll even find out as you go through the New Testament. Um, I don't know if I'd like to say, I don't know if I'd use the term it's on a, a higher level, but it's the Old Testament was meant to be temporary. The Old Testament was meant to give way to the New Testament. And so authoritative, as far as authority, the New Testament um, supersedes that. And yeah, and I mean, the Bible itself uses that term better. It, it is a better covenant. Um, Peter also mentions that, uh, let, let's all go together to 2 Peter 3. This, this is important. Um, he mentions and connects Paul's writings with authority. Second Peter 3.15, he says here, an account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So he connects Paul's writings with scripture, and he also, or with authority rather, and, and then he also uses this term other, Peter's writings and Paul's writings are mentioned as scripture. So that's important. There's this need for authority. And so Peter and Paul are writing and they, they say that when they write, they're writing with authority. Uh, all these inspired letters were needful to all churches. Colossians 4.16, we noticed that last week uh, when he mentions the epistle of, to the Laodiceans. And, and when, you, when you read this, he says, Colossian brethren, when you read this letter, Pass it to the church at Laodicea. Let them read it there and get the letter from Laodicea and read it before the Colossian church. So uh, the idea of circulation of these letters. Uh, there's also the need for a standard authority. Really, I, I, I debated. In fact, I actually intended this morning. I guess I just forgot. I was going to just combine these two because it's kind of basically saying the same thing. Uh, but Matthew 16, 18, where, where Jesus says, Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Um, I think I meant to put verse 19 where he goes on and says, I will give thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Um, the, the apostles being that standard of authority. Acts 2.47, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14.37, we mentioned numerous times. Acts 2.42 about the apostles' doctrine. Uh, so it's this standard of authority. And like I said, that's basically what we just talked about in that first point. But then there was also... The, the collection of the canon of New Testament was stimulated by the, by the heresies that began to arise. Um, false teaching, false doctrines, uh, departures from the faith. And so as, as those began to creep up, then there was a standard of authority that was needed. Marcion, uh, for example, was an early heretic. and uh, Marcion did not like anything pertaining to Jews. He didn't want to. He didn't want any of the Old Testament to be Scripture. Um, people say he basically included just Paul's writings as Scripture. That's not entirely true. That's mostly what he included. Um, he actually included Luke as his one gospel account. Uh, he didn't like John because John was a Jew, um, so he didn't like that book, that gospel account. Matthew was a Jew, so he didn't like that gospel account. Mark was a, is a very Jewish gospel account as far as having that flavor to it, so to speak. Um, but Luke was a, was a Gentile, and he wrote this gospel account. So Marcion held on to Luke. Um, he didn't, as I, I'm trying to remember, I don't think he liked Acts of the Apostles because so many of them were Jewish and they preached so much to the Jews. Uh, he was very anti-Semitic. But for whatever reason, he just basically tried to trash all the New Testament except for anything that was almost purely uh, Gentile-related. But early Christians had to know that they had all the truth and they needed it to deal with heretics. Well, you know, Marcion, you're not right about that. Well, how do, how do you know? Uh, Marcion, this book belongs in the New Testament. You can't just throw it out. Well, how do you know? So there's a, that's a, a stimulus for collecting these books into a, a, a canon. Missionary efforts also stimulated the collection of these books. Well, you know, you've got to start translating into other languages. Well, you know, I don't know about you, but translation, it's, it's not an easy thing. I don't want to just go translating any and every book. It, you know, it, it, my father-in-law will tell you, having done mission work in two different uh, countries where they didn't speak uh, English, 
that translation is a big task and when it comes to translating scripture that's very challenging many times so you don't want to just challenge any and everything if it's not going to be uh, useful to help people get to heaven so you got to determine well what books what letters are we going to translate we don't want to translate them if they're not authoritative and especially if they have something that might lead men astray uh, by the way this also shows the end of the miraculous age because uh, otherwise why wouldn't they just send somebody over there to speak in tongues because tongues is not some kind of mysterious God talk in the New Testament. If you sh and, and again, that's another study for another day. But tongues just means speaking another language. Well, if, if the miraculous is still there, and, and same goes today, then what you would do, that was God's plan. That was the whole point of tongue speaking. It was a sign to unbelievers. You could go preach to them in their language, and they would understand it. Well, they couldn't do that. Why? Because the miraculous ceased. 1 Corinthians 13, 8 to 10, when that which is perfect is come or complete then that which is in part will be done away the miraculous was the in part system whereas the written word is the complete so missionary efforts made it necessary <clears throat> persecution also made it necessary to collect the canon of scripture which which writings which teachings are you going to be willing to lay down your life for i mean i don't know about you but I, I mentioned before, I like J.R.R. Tolkien's writings, but if somebody comes to me and says, you know, renounce this, this Lord of the Rings book or we're going to take you and burn you at the stake, I'll say, hey, man, you can have it. I like it, but I don't like it that much. I want to live. But you know what? If somebody comes to me and says, renounce the New Testament of Jesus Christ or be burned at the stake, well, I tell you what, I, I, I hope that I would have the courage and the faithfulness to say, you know what, you just burned me at the stake then because I'm not renouncing my Lord, as so many Christians did in the early centuries after the church was established. They gave their lives not just for any old book, but for the book of God, the book God breathed, 2 Timothy 3.16. So which teachings, which writers are you going to die for? You don't want to die for something that's uninspired scripture. So again, that stimulated the collection of these into a book. In fact, I was reading one book, and I, it was... Um, Oh, I can't remember. There's a guy named Bruce Metzger. He's a, he's a real author, uh, good authority on this type of study, how we got the Bible and canon. But then there's another guy named F.F. F. Bruce who also has a lot of good material. But I think it was F.F. F. Bruce that said there, were, there was actually, uh, you, can, you can research and find early Christians writing about there were certain books that when the Roman authorities came to your house and said, give them over we're getting rid of these that the early church as early as late first century early second century they were already establishing this this list of books that they would say okay here's a book that you can turn over and and that's that's fine here's a book that you ha you would die for before you would turn it over in other words certain ones scripture certain ones not and by the way the ones that they were saying die for they're books of the new testament so you know he was this, this writer, I think it was F.F. F. Bruce, he was using that to illustrate that even that early, they knew what books were, belonged in the New Testament, what books were part of Scripture. Um, what's next? Uh, let's look at this real quick. There's not a whole lot to this. You know, there were only about five books that were ever really questioned out of the New Testament. We looked at that from the Old Testament. Hebrews. Why do you reckon anybody would question Hebrews? They just didn't know who the author was. Um, and this really was because of a dispute, a dispute between the Eastern churches and the Western churches. Uh, don't ask me which one was which, but one, one region said Paul wrote it, the other region said we just don't know who wrote it. And so they argued over it, they didn't, they didn't have an author. You can understand if Paul is the author, and I believe he is, <clears throat> if he's the author, you can understand why he wouldn't put his name on this. Because he, I mean, you know, he's writing to the Hebrews, they hated him. He was viewed as a turncoat by the Jews. And so they're not going to listen to him. They're not going to be nearly as likely to listen if they think it's coming from this turncoat as they viewed in Paul, now Paul the Apostle. So Hebrews was questioned because nobody knew the author. James, some folks said like Ecclesiastes, they thought it was too skeptical. I don't really understand that, but that's what some folks said. Um, but again, you've got to understand the purpose. It's wisdom literature. And then Second and Third John, basically because they were short, and uh, so, you know, sometimes some of these are kind of silly. Uh, 
2 Peter was spoken against because uh, some said it was not written by Peter. Some said it was just a copy of Jude. And then finally, Revelation, the book of Revelation, was spoken against in the East, rejected in the East, because it's apocalyptic language. They just didn't like the fact that it was apocalyptic language. And for some reason, they felt like that just didn't belong in the New Testament. But uh, we'll, we'll see more as we go along how those began, how those were accepted, even though there was some question. But you, you see, those are the only questions uh, regarding uh, Scripture as far as the New Testament. Jude was questioned by some for the same reason as Second Peter. They just flip flop and say, well, Jude is a copy of Second Peter uh, with some changes on it. So those are, your, those are really the only question books you have out of 27. So that's pretty amazing. But we'll, we'll look some more next week, Lord willing, as we go along and see how this all came together into what we now refer to as the New Testament, this compilation of, of letters and, and books that were written to various individuals and or churches. Questions or comments very quickly? Anything? Thank y'all very much. We'll take a break before worship. Thanks. <laughs> you rascal. <laughs>